Let's start with this because I think this is probably um, probably the most important question for the audience that we have right now. Why should anybody care? So, so why should an American who has got, you know, we, we, free speech is under attack and we've got Islamic terrorists to, to worry about and we've got Trump and a massive budget and all the nonsense that is happening out of Washington. Why should this rise up and, and, and catch your attention? Why is this something that Americans should be reading now, right now? And of course, Europeans as well, because we've got a lot, of, a lot of listeners from Europe and Asia and Africa and everywhere else. So why should anybody in South America, I shouldn't forget that. Why should anybody around the world care? I think the answer is that the, this conflict is not essentially about two groups of people fighting over one piece of land, which is how it's often understood. It is much wider than that. It is a conflict between what is essentially a free society and various movements and causes that are hostile to human life and freedom. And that's been true for the last 70 years in different forms and different shapes. So that's essentially, it's a battlefront for anyone who can, who's concerned with freedom and human progress and human life fundamentally. So that's sort of the big picture context. And one of the major groups in this conflict is the Islamist movement. So the same goals that Al-Qaeda and ISIS have are the goals of Hamas and Islamic Palestinian, Islamic Jihad, and all of the groups that would want to lead the Palestinian movement. And so the Palestinian movement has become a subset of the Islamist movement globally. And of course, Al-Qaeda. So if you look at Osama bin Laden's publications, one of his earliest uh, letters to the world was the Palestine question, how we must use that to rise up against the West. So they view it as a battlefront, and it really is a battlefront in that respect. Then a secondary issue is that America has been neck deep in this conflict, and that has been a significant problem. Uh, and I mean that in the sense that my view of America's role in the conflict is that it was a rational policy that we pursued. And we, in, you know, the goal was to solve it, right? For the last 25 odd years, we've been pursuing what's called the peace process, which is bringing the Palestinian and Israelis together for negotiations outcome of that approach, which I talk about in the book, is it's actually made the conflict way worse than it was before, whether you measure it in terms of the, the, the amount of fighting, the death tolls, and sort of the, the moral dimension of the encouragement to the Palestinian cause and Islamists more generally. So America has created, has been involved in this conflict in a deep way. It's made our Middle East, situ our interest in the Middle East much sort of more imperiled and then sort of if you want to zoom out and look at the Middle East in general, a lot of people in the foreign policy establishment or sort of the, the people who work in this field have a view that the conflict is central to the whole region's upheavals. And now yeah, that's a peace on earth, if not for the Israeli-Palestinian right. conflict. Yes. Right. Now, that view is much less credible these days if you've paid attention to Syria or if you've paid attention to Egypt. Because, you know, the Syrian uprising that became a civil war had very zero to do with Israel-Palestine. And the Egyptian Arab Spring had nothing to do with Israel-Palestine. But that view that the conflict... Well, the is, war in Yemen and, right. and the, the, you know, the civil war 20, 30 years ago in Algeria and the conflict in Morocco. And, you know, it just goes on and on and on. The idea is so ludicrous, it's never had any currency. I mean, it, it, well, it... it it's never been plausible, I think, if you understand it, but it has, the, the problem is that it has currency That's right. That's um, right. in the sense that it's animated American policy. And so it's given the conflict a kind of, um, uh, but I do think it's important to the region. So if you want to understand the region, you have to understand that the rise of Islamists is, is integral to this conflict. The, yeah. the conflict is not separable from that. And how American policy has approached this conflict has had an impact on the Islamists. To so give you one sort of concrete, um, the, uh, the, the Bush years, George W. Bush. So he's seen as the most pro-Israel president in recent memory. Maybe Trump is going to eclipse him in some people's minds because of the things he's done over Jerusalem as the capital. But for a long time, Bush has been the most pro-Israel president. Bush, as you, I mean, you know this, but I think the audience needs to hear that 
Bush's policy of bringing elections to the Middle East impacted the Israeli-Palestinian conflict by putting the Islamist resistance movement known as Hamas to most people in power, basically, in Gaza and supercharged them in a way that led to several wars in this conflict. So there's many dimensions to the way in which America has interest in the region from the perspective of- Riding on Bush, can I add to that? Go ahead. <laughs> because, you know, my favorite topic, other than going after Trump, I think, but, but going after Bush is, not only did he promote democracy and bring about Hamas, and ultimately I think led to the Arab Spring and all the negative consequences that have come from that, but I think, but also he, he prevented Israel from being tough. So he weakened Israel. And I remember at least two, maybe three situations in which in those days, Arik Sharon, who was, you know, relative to Israeli prime ministers was sometimes tough, surrounded Yasser Arafat's compound. And, and, and you could imagine him wanting to kill Arafat. And you could, could imagine that going through Arik Sharon's mind and him getting phone calls from Bush saying, you can't touch him. You cannot do it. And, and what, sig- what message does that send to the world? At the same time as we're supposedly fighting terrorism, at the same time as he, post 9-11 and all of that, the weakness that that projects to the world. And, and, and this from the most Israeli-friendly president supposedly ever. So just to flesh out your, your account, so this happened in 2002, and there literally was a phone call. Don't yeah. touch him. If you touch him, you're in trouble. So this is 2002 before the rise of Hamas. And what's relevant is what people might not realize is 2002 was the, the ramping up of a um, terrorist war within Israel led by Arafat. And we, do, we have documentation. This isn't a, it was out of his control. This was, he's directing it. And he was, he had a shipment of ammunition, like 80 tons of ammunition that was um, uh, intercepted heading to, so he was waging a war and here's President Bush saying, you know, here are the handcuffs, put them on yourself and don't take any further action against this guy who is sort of, if you want a counterpart, he was sort of the bin Laden within this conflict. You know, if America was facing a bin Laden and the jihadist broadly. So to sum up the, the point, why, who cares about this? Well, whether you care about it or not, the Middle East cares about you. You know, I hate to quote, uh, to paraphrase Trotsky, but there's something to that point. The Middle East... It, the, the jihadists are involved in this conflict. We've done things in our irrational policy that have made it worse and it, it sort of elevated the significance of the conflict. But then if you, what's distinctive to, I think what our context brings is if you really care about freedom and human life and progress, independent of the conflict, there's one country in that region that deserves your attention, which is there's things to learn about it. So. Here's Israel, and there's a lot of faults and flaws to it, and I talk about those in the book, but there's one thing that I think is important. Government is a necessary good, and Israel has created a society that is essentially free in a region that isn't just mediocre free, that isn't just mixed economy free, that is actually run by monarchs, dictators, and theocrats, and that, uh, whose, whose goal in, in, in running a country isn't I mean, it's it's basically methodically to subordinate and exploit people and kill them, enslaving people, basically. So here you have a region where there's actually a virtuous country in the sense of political virtue, creating a free society, and it's prospered. It's not just a, so it's a, it's a demonstration of the value of freedom in a region that solely needs it. And, you know, American presidents have spoken for a century about we stand with those who stand for freedom, but they don't. And here's an opportunity that calls out for using freedom as the principle. So this is part of what the book argues. This is the framework to use to guide you. Who's, who's really stands with freedom, regardless of their race, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of all those things. And that's how you should shape your approach. And that includes anyone in the Arab world and the Palestinian world who really cares for freedom. They deserve your attention. And then when you, when you add on top of that, that their enemies are, Islamic totalitarians who are trying to exter- like stamp out human freedom and prosperity. Okay, well, to me, that draws a bright line in the sand. You know, it, it's clear what you need to understand here. Yeah, so, so you're saying there are two reasons people should really understand the conflict. One is because it, they, we share an enemy, and the enemy is Islamic totalitarian uh, Islamism that, that is clearly trying to kill Americans and has killed Americans. And, Westerners, generally Europeans, and, and this is a conflict going on really all over the world. And second, 
and, and this is something we'll, we need to talk more about. If you care about freedom, then you should care about places where freedom is threatened and you should care about defending the, those societies, those cultures, those governments, those countries that are free against barbarism. So this is an opportunity to educate yourself about, about freedom and, and about the threats to freedom. And, and uh, 